I've always thought it was remarkable that Tolkien basically spent his entire life creating what he called the secondary world. You know, he created the languages, he created the thousands of years of history. It's so rich and so detailed that nobody today that writes a piece of fiction is ever going to come close to the sheer wealth of information and detail. Of course, all of that makes it fiendishly difficult to adapt into any sort of movie. Behind one of the most ambitious film projects in history is the extremely popular book, the result of the life's work of one man. John Ronald Rule Tolkien was born on the 3rd of January, 1892, in Bloemfontein, South Africa, to English parents who had emigrated there. Just a month after his fourth birthday, when John Ronald was in Birmingham visiting his grandparents, his father, Arthur, died suddenly. Tolkien became half-orphaned in a country he didn't know. The absence of a father would have affected him. In a way, he became the father to his younger brother. Um, he was raised by his mother, who he uh, was very close to. In 1904, Mabel died from complications arising from diabetes. Tolkien was only 12. After that, he was shuffling from one place to another with only a guardian to look after him. There were something like 10 different houses he lived in in the city. That life is quite a complicated one, quite an eventful one for a child. His mother had been his first teacher, encouraging him to take an interest in words. Her death cemented his study of languages. And I think in those circumstances, the school really was the, the refuge. It was the, uh, the stable element in his life. And I also think it was a particularly good school for the likes of Tolkien. The school, I would say, was not remarkable for uh, literary development, but it was uh, very remarkable for producing uh, linguists. He formed a close bond with three school friends, and together they created the Tea Club of the Barovian Society, known as the TCBS, a small club based on the mutual love of heroic legends and sagas. This close friendship and shared interest in ancient languages continued throughout Tolkien's time in Oxford, where he went in 1911 to study English language and literature. But this idyllic period came to an end with the outbreak of war. Tolkien departed for France, serving as a lieutenant in the Battle of the Somme. Likewise, all of his close friends were drawn into the combat. He had a, a small group of close friends, and uh, a few years later, nearly all of them were dead, all killed in, uh, in the First World War. But once again, he found himself on his own. How could it not have had a marked effect on the way he wrote and the way he thought? And, and people do say that the major theme of his writing is death. During rare moments of quiet, he jotted down stories in a notebook, which he called the Book of Lost Tales. That's where Middle Earth was born. Some of the very earliest writings of Middle Earth that um, Tolkien created were done in pencil on a notebook while he was in the trenches. Tolkien's love of languages would eventually lead to him creating his own, and his lifelong pursuit of creating such language engendered the desire to create his own mythology. He felt deeply that England lacked a mythology. Well, England has no overriding mythology. We have a lot of folk tales, and we have borrowed a lot of other people's mythologies. The one that everybody regards as English is the story of King Arthur. But actually, that's a complete mishmash of, from different sources, many of them French, our old enemy. So for Tolkien, the Romance mythologies were a very difficult thing. He didn't feel that they should be part of, of English folklore or mythology at all. He really mourned the fact that any mythology that England may have had had been basically eradicated by the Norman invasion in 1066. There was this vacuum that Tolkien wanted to fill by inventing his own English mythology. Right at the end of his life, he was still working on the mythology of Middle Earth, and he died with his great sort of life work only partially complete, the Silmarillion, which was the story that he was writing in the trenches in 1917, wasn't published until after his death. And his son Christopher had to step in and, uh, and, and do the, the finishing touches. Yet during his lifetime, elements of this mythology would reach the world through his novels. Tolkien returned to Oxford in 1925 as professor of Anglo-Saxon. But nine years later, an unexpected and seemingly innocuous event would change the life of this Oxford don forever.
We have a story about Tolkien inventing hobbits. There he is, you know, marking his examination papers, which is extremely boring, and he turns over and he finds a blank sheet and he writes on it, in a hole in the ground there lived a hobbit. And that's the start of the whole thing. And so, the story of this small, nature-loving creature found its way into print. Well, my father was the publisher, and he believed that children were the best judges of children's books. He used to pay me, as a supplement to my pocket money, a shilling. So the Hobbit came along, and I wrote my report. It wasn't a great piece of literary criticism, but it was good enough. My report on The Hobbit was dated the 30th of October, 1936. Bilbo Baggins was a hobbit who lived in his hobbit hole and never went for adventures. At last, Gandalf the wizard and his dwarves persuaded him to go. He had a very exciting time fighting goblins and wargs, and after a terrific battle with the goblins, he returned home rich. This book, with the help of maps, does not need any illustrations. It is good and should appeal to all children between the ages of five and nine. In those happy days, no second opinion was needed. If I said it was good enough to publish, it was published. With the success of The Hobbit, Tolkien was encouraged by Stanley Unwin to write a sequel. He thus began to delve back into the mythology he'd been working on his whole life, and it became The Lord of the Rings. He sat down and began to write the first page of The Lord of the Rings without any planning at all. There was no scheme, no synopsis. I mean, I've been through all those first drafts, those papers which all still survive, and it's perfectly clear that he was flying blind. He never intended it to be what it was, and it gradually shaped itself as he wrote it. To be a convincing story, you've got to know what you're talking about in every detail. You've got to know what the geology, the geography, the history, which Tolkien had already mapped out years and years before. It was as real to Tolkien as history. Even though The Lord of the Rings is regarded sort of as, you know, the Tolkien masterpiece, he only regarded it as being a very small piece of the mythology. It was only just the tip of an iceberg. He knew and he'd written and put in the box files an awful lot that never was in his lifetime known to anybody. It also gives Lord of the Rings its enormous depth and that is what somehow makes it transcend a piece of fiction and it does feel much more authentic that no author who writes a piece of fiction would, would spend this amount of time, basically a lifetime, on creating the world behind the fiction. I desired to do this for my own satisfaction, and I had little hope that other people would be interested in this work, especially since it was primarily linguistic in inspiration and was begun in order to provide the necessary background of history for elvish tongues. This was simply an outlet for his huge imagination, which had been stimulated by philology, by studying Germanic languages, by studying Norse sagas, by studying Anglo-Saxon poetry, and that drove him not just to be a scholarly investigator of it, but to be a creator in the same genre. The first volume of the Lord of the Rings trilogy, The Fellowship of the Ring, was published by Allen and Unwin in 1954. It had taken Tolkien 12 years to complete his epic work. By now, he was nearly 60. He was exacting to a degree on uh, how the book was uh, produced. Uh, he was uh, um, uh, extremely um, stubborn and obstinate, and he wrote it the way he wanted to. You did not go around editing Tolkien. That would have been the absolute final sin. After all, he was a professor of English language and literature and uh, knew what he was writing. I had very carefully made my estimate of losing a thousand pounds on the basis that there would be a fall off. There wasn't. In fact, by the time we got to publishing book three, we had increased our print number and on the way to reprinting one and two. Over time, the book increased in popularity, eventually becoming the 20th century's second most read book after the Bible. He was uh, both pleased and gratified by the, uh, the success, but it wasn't because of the money. He was, he was gratified because it proved his point. And there was an element in it, I would have said, of, of schadenfreude. You know, they told him all his life that he was a kind of, uh, you know, flogging a dead horse. And it wasn't a dead horse, it was a derby winner. Tolkien fan clubs began to spring up almost as soon as the book became well known. Not quite as when it was published, it was published in the 50s, but by the 60s they were starting to appear. You began to go to uh, New York subway and see 
uh, sort of uh, inscriptions on the walls saying Frodo lives. And uh, you began to realize that something was happening. And people were writing him letters telling him that uh, they had adopted the names of his characters and they were getting married in ceremonies based on his books. And he was actually very upset by this because he was actually able to detach himself from his own invention. The phenomenon of the Lord of the Rings continues today and its popularity can be attributed to fundamental themes of human existence. The themes of Tolkien are another way of honoring the book because, you know, as we were saying, there's so much detail that you ultimately can't you can't recreate the world of The Lord of the Rings, you know, with, with everything in the books, but the thematic material is obviously critically important to translate that from book to film because the themes are ultimately at the heart of any book. And Tolkien's themes in particular were in his heart. There's a tendency to expect too much of Tolkien and to expect answers that he never intended to provide. And there's a simultaneous oversimplification of what he wrote. Tolkien himself was horrified at modern analogies being placed on, on his work. He always rejected the notion that uh, the stories were based on World War II and the rise of Hitler and all that. I think to apply modern political thinking on a story that is essentially 50 years old is a little bit inappropriate. Tolkien's famous for disliking allegory and uh, maintaining with great force in his foreword to The Lord of the Rings that uh, this is not an allegory. As for any inner meanings or message, it has in the intention for the author none. It is neither allegorical nor topical. I cordially dislike allegory and all its manifestations and always have done so since I grew old and wary enough to detect its presence. I much prefer history, true or feigned, with its varied applicability to the thought and experience of readers. I think that many confuse applicability with allegory, but the one resides in the freedom of the reader and the other in the purpose domination of the author. What he means by allegory, of course, is that uh, you can have a one-to-one a, a -one substitution. So the ring equals, I don't know, nuclear energy. That kind of uh, simple-minded uh, interpretation is exactly what he was trying to avoid, and it's part of his genius that he didn't write an allegorical book. That's why it, new generations of readers can keep on finding meanings from their own lives because of what he called applicability, to enable you to fill in the precise meanings of the various things you're reading about from your own experience. I think what Lord of the Rings is very good at portraying is that you can be courageous without having courage. He was, I believe, writing the antithesis of commercial fiction. This notion of being able to go on and finding hope in hopelessness. The most poignant statements in The Lord of the Rings are the elves, for example, who have been fighting what Galadriel calls the long defeat. And they've been knowing that they will lose for the last few thousand years, but they will continue fighting until they're defeated. Courage is also shown by plodding on even when you have no hope in the affair at all. It is in the dark moment that the eye begins to see. You know, it's like when you've reached your lowest point. When things look bleakest, that's when you really get a wake-up call. Something is found within you know, to deal with the situation, to at least make the effort. The emphasis on courage against overwhelming odds is essentially a, a pagan point of view. You fight on even though you know that in the end you will lose. You can't have courage without fear. You can't be truly brave without knowing that there is something to fear and to overcome that fear in order to go out there and face it. You cannot weigh up the likelihood of your success as part of your venture. And that is why Frodo makes such a wonderful hero, because he is a halfling, he is a hobbit, he is small, and the forces he faces are huge. Frodo's not the only hero. And of course, without the heroism of all the people who helped him, Frodo would have failed. Our fates are all interconnected, as opposed to depending on this heroic individualism. Tolkien was profoundly pluralist. The Lord of the Rings is a multicultural 
and multiracial book. Against that pluralism, you have Mordor, which is one ring, one ring to rule them all. I think Tolkien himself, personally, was quite pessimistic. But I think there's hope in the books. This is a phrase Tolkien used, by the way, hope without guarantees, a very good description of what his book offers. Despair is for people who know, beyond any doubt, what the future is going to be. Nobody's in that position. So despair is not only a kind of sin, theologically, it's also a simple mistake, because nobody actually knows. In that sense, there always is hope. That's what's interesting about this story. There's no guarantee at any point of success. That's something no one can predict, you know, what will happen. Even Galadriel, when it comes to it, you know, in so many words, says to Frodo, I can't tell you what's going to happen. I don't know. More so than just being a straight struggle of good and evil, it is a struggle over, over loving the values of your world and being prepared to fight to the death to protect them. It seems to me that the ring wraiths are Tolkien's most um, original and distinctive image of evil. And uh, since he's a philologist, I think we should think about the word wraith. All right, what's a wraith? Well, it's actually related to words we know. For instance, it's related to wrath, which is anger. It's related to wreath, which is a twisted thing. It's related to the word writhe, which is to, you know, to twist and turn. And all these suggest that actually a wraith is uh, uh, something which is defined by shape, not by substance. There's this vacuity, this emptiness at the heart of the ring wraiths. They actually, in a sense, have no lives of their own. They're totally dependent on Sauron and on the One Ring. That's an interesting aspect of Tolkien's view of evil, kind of a moral vacuum, a lack of independent life. This is something which is uh, very distinctively modern. People of Tolkien's generation had a problem identifying evil. Uh, they had no difficulty recognizing it. They had to live through it. But the puzzling thing was that this seemed to be carried out by entirely normal people. And indeed, Tolkien, who was a, a combat veteran, knew that his own side did things like that too. The nature of evil in the 20th century has been curiously impersonal. It's as if sometimes nobody particularly wants to do it. In the end, you get the major atrocities of the 20th century being carried out by bureaucrats. Well, the people who do that kind of thing are wraiths. They've gone through the racing process. They don't know what's good and evil anymore. It's become a job or a routine. You start out with the good intentions, but somehow it all goes wrong. So it's a curiously distinctive image of evil, and I should also say it's a very unwelcome one, because what it says is it could be you. And in fact, under the right circumstances, or I should say the wrong circumstances, it will be you. You know, when people say that the, this kind of fantasy fiction is, uh, is escapist and evading the real world and so on, well, I think that's uh, an evasion. It's actually trying to confront something that most people would rather not confront. We can never be quite sure about the ring, which I think is entirely appropriate to the story. Right at the start, um, Gandalf asks Frodo to hand him the ring. And when Frodo passes it over, case, then the ring is actually an external power and can actually deceive you even when you don't mean it to. And if, uh, if it's just from outside you and, you know, everybody can be trusted, good people can be trusted, then there's no real problem, is there? Anybody could take the ring. But that's not the case. We're told that again and again. You must take it. You cannot offer me this ring. I'm giving it to you. Don't tempt me, Frodo. I dare not take it. Nobody can be trusted because there's something in everybody's heart which is the start of the racing process. So the ring works both ways. Uh, in some ways it's an external power which is frightening and aggressive and which you've got to resist. In some ways it's a sort of psychic amplifier which brings out what your own uh, problems and weaknesses are. It's clear that the ring is, uh, in its way, addictive. Um, it's got all the complexities of that state. Nobody can trust themselves.
As to what people are being addicted to, it seems to me that's really very clear. It is power. People start off with good intentions. They want the power in order to carry out the good intentions. But once they've got the power, they won't give it up, and the good intentions turn increasingly to bad intentions. The ring is also very contemporary because I think it has a profound affinity with technology. He had a real problem with technology. He described once that the most evil creation ever visited on mankind was the internal combustion engine. Technology is very powerful, very seductive, very addictive. The whole of society becomes incredibly dependent on technology so that when something does go wrong, it goes very wrong. Tolkien had a respect for the earth that was profound. The thing about Middle Earth in, in Lord of the Rings is it's like a character in itself with autonomy and subjectivity, and that's a profoundly ecological point of view. He did not agree at all with this view that nature is simply a passive set of resources for us to use as we will. During his lifetime, uh, you had continuing urban expansion. You had urban creep. The city was going through enormous changes. It was gradually becoming the city of a, a million people. He could see the city creeping up the hill. So that the area which he lived in, which he remembered as uh, lush and, uh, and pastoral and beautiful, uh, really became absorbed into a major industrial city. All those processes are still happening and in some respects they've gathered steam. Things are going faster and faster in that direction. And in that sense Tolkien's relevance is bound to increase. For myself as a reader what I find in there is a story that is timeless. And this is why it made it so uh, accessible to uh, so many people. As filmmakers, as writers, we had no interest whatsoever in putting our junk, our baggage into these movies. We, we just thought we, we should take what Tolkien cared about clearly. We should take those and we should put them into the film. This should ultimately be Tolkien's film, it shouldn't be ours. I first read The Lord of the Rings when I was 18. I, I loved the book, thought it would make a great film, assumed that somebody one day would make a live action film and that I'd get to go along and see it. I did find it was probably one of the first literary experiences that sort of really taught me the meaning of how powerful the written word is. You know, I read the books when I was in sort of twenties and so it always left a quite a vivid memory. I got hold of a copy from my dad when I was about 15 and he said, I'll give you about six months to read it. And I think I read it in about two months. Um, I've been a Tolkien fan ever since my mother first bought the book for me when I was 12 and said, oh, I think you might like this, have a read of this. Yeah, well, I, I first read The Lord of the Rings in 1961. And at that point, I was totally blown away from it. It was my first year in college and I thought, this is something like I've never seen before. The first copy of The Lord of the Rings that I ever owned was the paperback edition that had a a, a, a still from the Ralph Bakshi film on the cover of the Black Riders um, galloping out of Bree was the, was the image. I remember it really clearly. I've probably still got the book somewhere. Virtually everyone in a, in a significant position on the movie uh, knew the books inside out, had been obsessed with them for years. The first thing that Fran and I did was to take the three books of The Lord of the Rings and to break it down into what turned out to be a 90-page treatment. I read that in the middle of 97 and immediately was stunned that they'd actually managed to... There it was, there was Lord of the Rings, essentially Lord of the Rings. Um, so I became a believer. It was our first pass at really cracking the code of the Lord of the Rings is the way that I sort of think, think of it as basically, you know, saying, well, the book is a great book, the story is a great story, the characters are great, but it's unfilmable. And it is unfilmable if you were to just shoot the book page by page, scene by scene. It would just be a mess. You've got a book that's a thousand pages long. It encompasses a, a different geography, all kinds of races of beings and creatures. It's a book that took the author 15 years to write. This is a challenging book to try and put on film. You know, I always find that literal adaptations don't work. I think you've got to uh, find what you think is essential to the book and make your movie of that. And in that way, you know, um, things ha started to happen, like, you know, lines that Elrond would say in the book were given to Aragorn to say in the movie. You know, a, a line that might appear in Lothlorien was suddenly, you know, put into the mines of Moria. 
but they're nonetheless, they're still to Tolkien's language, it's still his words. Miramax, of course, were the first people to finance Lord of the Rings. Credit has to be given to the fact that they were strong-minded enough to take on this incredible task. We wrote the first screenplay. Um, we immediately were going to start working on the second screenplay. And um, sort of towards the end there, Miramax was starting to say, well, we really feel like we want to do it in one film. And Peter said, there's no way I can tell this in, in one movie and do it any justice, so I can't do that. And uh, luckily, um, Miramax was like, hey, okay, fair enough. Well, you can go ahead and see if anybody else is interested. We had one, one chance of, 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 um, of continuing with the project. And I, and I said, we've got to somehow convince somebody to make two Lord of the Rings films. We've got four weeks to do it. And Peter trotted off to Hollywood, and he went to many of the studios and um, called upon his old friend Mark Gordeski, who was an executive at New Line. And Mark set up a meeting with Bob Shea. Bob is impossible to read. He's a completely inscrutable sort of meeting. Um, and you can't really tell how well you're doing. So he made this, Peter and Fran made the presentation, showed a lot of mock-ups, showed the tape, played the tape, lights came up, couldn't read the situation at all. Bob looked at uh, Peter and said, now Peter, why would anybody in their right mind make two movies? Which shattered them both, because they didn't quite know what he meant. He said, this is three films. Well, thank God for that decision. Once New Line were on board, we had to basically take our two scripts that we'd written for Miramax, um, and we had to now reorganize these into three different movies. And that, that really involved a total restructuring, page one rewrite, basically. Philippa Boyens. She's one of those people that had read Lord of the Rings like once a year, every year, <laughs> since she was 16 years old and uh, knew everything about Lord of the Rings. And so, and so we invited Philippa on board. The collaboration between the three of us came down to Fran and I working incredibly closely together, lo locked in the hotel rooms, locked in the, the office at home, uh, getting the work done. Uh, Fran then taking it to Peter and reshaping, and often we'd come to bits where we knew there was uh, action involved, so we'd just go, you know, they fight. <laughs> and it turns into 20 minutes of the finished film. <laughs> because you just knew Peter was going to come along and, and, and do it brilliantly. And the reverse, I have to say, is true. Peter did that with the kissing. He would just say, he'd just hand it over to us and say, well, that's, that's your department. There were probably some times when it was a bit of two against one, when it was actually Philip and Fran, you know, going against him and Peter, and, and uh, you know, he's like the only guy with these two women sort of pounding away on these issues. <laughs> it tends to be me on the laptop, because I'm the fastest typist. I'm sorry, guys, but I am. <laughs> Fran always, uh, she likes to write by hand, um, and her scripts are the ones that are covered with, with writing. I like to keep my scripts really clean. <laughs> It's like scrawled all over. So she's usually sitting on the floor surrounded by notes, surrounded by the scripts, um, and lots of paper. And uh, Peter's, Peter would be, um, when he was shooting, he'd generally be lying on the couch completely exhausted because he'd just shot uh, right through the week, and this was his day off, and he was working on the script. The script was literally being rewritten, I'm not exaggerating, every single day and week for the entire 15-month shoot. Um, I, I would get pages faxed to me several times a week. We were constantly updating them, partially because of the interaction with the actors. We used to go around to Pete's house, which was great. And whoever was involved in the scenes, we'd go around and kind of chat through what that scene's about. And, and through that, a lot of the script kind of morphed into something else, you know? Pete and Fran and Philippa sat us down, uh, Billy and I primarily, and said, uh, write down anything that, that you are doing that is making you laugh, you know, um, and try and link it in with, with something in the book. There was a lot of plot lines that we sort of fleshed out, had ideas about uh, certain specific characteristics more than anything. Um, the idea of, of Frodo kind of playing with the ring and what would happen to him. Philippa and Fran were, were great, you know, they were so enthusiastic, you know, they, they, they were so happy to, to, 
I suppose to be working on something like we all were, but I mean there was great enthusiasm and passion in in how they spoke and how they how they how they wanted to work with you and it was never you could ring them any time, any time, night or day, and if you had a problem you could discuss anything with them. Um, I can remember going out to dinner one night and Philippa and I sitting at the end just dreaming and her asking for a napkin or a matchbook from the restaurant just to write it all down on because it was, you know, beautiful stuff what we were coming up with. Sometimes you would start a scene one day and, um, and under your door at night there would come a, a few rewrites through. When I say a few rewrites through, I have two file boxes that big um, filled with rewrites. I have to tell you, some are still in the envelopes unopened um, because I was sometimes so tired, I thought, oh, hell, never mind. The actors who were now starting to own their characters were, you know, firing ideas to us, which, you know, I mean, some of them are good and some of them aren't, but you certainly gratefully accept the good, the good ideas, you know, and um, and this, you know, Fran described it as... Uh, as, as furiously laying the tracks in front of the train it was as it was rumbling up behind you. There was no stopping the train and the tracks just had to go down. And it made for a degree of sort of controlled chaos. The artistic result was terrific. The scenes that have been hardest to translate from the book into the film are actually the um, exposition scenes, and by that I mean scenes that have to explain a lot of detail about the plot. Early on in the development of, of uh, The Fellowship of the Ring, Peter hit upon the idea of doing a prologue. He knew he was going to have to go through this long period of exposition, so he wanted something exciting, um, almost like you would do with a Bond movie. We really do need to like get people into the headspace and let them understand some of what we're talking about so that when the story really kicks in and they've got you know they've got a background on things peter was very specific about what he needed i need to set up isildur i need to set up nasal i need to set up the battle of dagolad uh, we need to introduce sauron we want to introduce the immortality of the elves and we want to track the journey of the ring to being lost um and you can't do it in more than four pages and so that's what i did i I, I sat down and I thought about it. And that's where the history became legend, legend became myth, and some things that should not have been forgotten were lost. That's where they came from, that survived, actually. They rang me back and, and they were great. They just said, we can't believe you just did that. <laughs> there are lots of things in these films which are not in the books. And I think in most cases they're improvements. Because they are scenes that do have to be seen and they add a lot to it. Other people are going to complain about the absence of Tom Bombadil. Sad, yes, but I mean, this could go on and on and on and on and on. And the plot of The Lord of the Rings in our movie in its most simple form is Frodo carrying the ring. Eventually has to go to Mordor and destroy the ring. So, you know, what does Old Man Willow contribute to the story of Frodo carrying the ring? What does Tom Bombadil ultimately really have to do with the ring? I know there's ring stuff in the Bombadil episode, but it's not really advancing our story and not really telling us things that we need to know. And if you look at the edit, we don't know that they didn't go into the old forest. We don't know that they didn't meet Tom. Conception, we, we just don't mention it. It's just left untold is what I, I like to, how I like to conceive. One of the hardest characters to come to grips with initially um, was the character of Arwen. She has a very small part to play in the books if you simply t look at the number of pages that Arwen is in. And in order to make her a character with some weight, we have had to create more material for Arwen. We went to the appendix and wanted to draw on the, the appendix and the story between Aragorn and Arwen and her choices. There's a snippet uh, from the lay of Luthien, you know, the song about Baron, the uh, mortal man, and Luthien, the elf maiden, which was a story that is mirrored in the relationship between Aragorn, mortal man, and Arwen, immortal elf maiden. Oh, 
Who is she? This woman you sing of. Tis the lay of Luthien, the elf maiden who gave her love to Beren, a mortal. So we have gone into that appendix for ideas and material which we can actually um, incorporate into the plot of the movies. One of the keys to adapting something of such wealth of detail to film is that everything needs to do more than one thing. We were trying to bring Mary and Pippin to life more, um, talking about ideas to do that, and I just said, well, Mary and Pippin should steal a, a, a firework and light, and light it. Even though I knew it wasn't in the book, I just felt that you need the energy at that point. You need because this is a party. You want to you want you want to see some lightness and fun at the front of this movie because it gets very dark and you're looking for something unexpected. You're introducing two main characters. You're saying something about them. You're also referencing an, an event that actually does take place in the book, which is the that Gandalf has a firework which becomes Smog, the dragon. So, you know, you want everything that you do to, to, to hopefully do three or four things in terms of turning that piece of prose into a film at the moment. One of the primary things it needs to do is reveal character. We try to do this with Gandalf. Um, Gandalf tells an awful lot of exposition in Bag End, but we also wanted it to reveal something of, of Gandalf's character so that it's not just telling. We did. We did do this. We, we, we waste a lot of time trying to bring so much of the world to life, trying to uh, explain some of the cultures, such as dwarves. And what we, we, did, we discovered is if you want to explain to an audience about the culture of dwarves, you cast John Rhys Davies as, as the dwarf, and he'll tell you, he'll show you, he'll bring that culture to life for you. We could pass through the mines of Moria. My cousin Balin would give us a royal welcome. Scenes like um, the Council of Elrond at Rivendell um, have been fiendishly difficult to turn into cinema because it is a group of people sitting around talking about the plot. I looked at the script pages and I knew that if we shot it as it was written, it will be 30, 40 minutes long. And you just, it's just like, couldn't do it. I think we approached Rivendell from every different direction you could possibly do. It got to the stage where it was like, don't make me go back there. I can't go back to Rivendell, please. It's a scene that needs to get the fellowship together uh, to establish the ring needs to be destroyed. Ring as the source of evil had to be somehow animated um, to almost become a character in the movie in and of itself. It ends up having personal relationships. It has a relationship with Frodo, has an intense relationship with Gollum, has a powerful relationship with Gandalf and Galadriel. This uh, ring, these books, which I, I love so dearly, it was uh, working with uh, Peter Jackson and Fran Walsh. Peter and Fran's sort of relationship as sort of filmmakers is, uh, is ideal, really, because Fran is so good at putting words down on paper, and Peter's so good at making, putting those words into vision. Peter and Fran uh, are a great team working together. They actually uh, they live and breathe the project, and uh, they manage to keep a family life together quite successfully. Fran, um, who you're probably not seeing on this, um, is for a very specific reason, and that one of them needs to remain private. And uh, Peter, by the very nature of what it is that he has to do, is the public face of that partnership. My abiding image is of seeing Peter early in the morning uh, sitting in his trademark shorts with unkempt hair, poring over Tolkien. And I would do the same, and I think the other actors did too. Yeah, everybody was respectful of Tolkien and mindful of, of the novel and had the novel in hand, you know, physically. It was with us even at the end, the last day, you'd see copies laying around the set. We were incredibly lucky to have that as source material, that as reference material, that, that, that kind of Bible to keep turning back to. Ian McKellen was there and he had the book in his hand. And he came up to me and he was like, remember, Sam grabs Frodo's hand, the fans will be looking for that. And I was like, right, oh, great, thank you, Ian. Sam must hardly lift your sight. We were that worried about you, weren't we, Mr. Gandalf? 
the interesting phenomena with our script writing is every draft that we wrote, it became closer and closer to what, what was in the book. It became nearer to Tolkien. They tried a lot of different things, and sometimes they were going to go, thought of going in a different direction from the book. And every time they tried to do that, gradually they find that actually Tolkien knew what he was doing with the story, and they would start going back to where, where he had started. I mean, there are things that sort of happened that I don't think were even within Peter's control that ended up changing the film and making it more like the book. Um, it's almost like it was meant to be. <laughs> and so, you know, whilst we're changing plot things, we're changing some events, we're changing characters, we're losing characters, while we're doing all the normal stuff that you have to do to adapt a book, um, we, we did want to be as accurate as possible into, into putting his thematic material into the film. When you're doing three films back to back, the danger of the train derailing was huge. We knew we had to plan these movies as, as detailed as we possibly could because there'd be little, very little room for error. When Peter set out to start designing the film, he basically pre-visualized every shot, uh, sometimes with a high level of detail, sometimes just as a sketch. It's to give everyone, including Peter, a good feel as to, okay, this, this is what the flavor of the film is, and he can, he can then evaluate where, where scenes are running too long, um, thing, even scenes that he may want to cut out entirely, all before he's wasting film, shooting actors and sets and having a crew costing tens of thousands standing around. We knew we had to keep run, run a very tight ship, as it were, so that when we started shooting, we knew we'd get it tired, we knew we'd get exhausted, that all sorts of pressures would descend on us, and we just had to have a great focused plan to be able to get us through each day. When we were developing the movie, Peter spent an extensive amount of time committing the film in its entirety to storyboards. And he ended up storyboarding all the films, you know, basically every frame we see in these films had already been storyboarded by, by Peter. And um, so we were able to work from visual reference. The storyboarding process was the most basic form of pre-visualizing the film. It's 2D pencil drawings, single panels, nothing's moving, there's no real evidence of what the camera moves are going to be. You get an idea, okay, we pan from this character to this character, we tilt down from this object to that object, but we don't get any feel for how fast those car you know, camera moves are, or actually even the logistics. Christian storyboarded most of the films that I made. He, he, I first met him when he was like a 17-year-old school kid. When I'm storyboarding with Peter, I think I've got the luckiest job on the planet. So you get a, a sort of an effect of the, the horses. I sit down with him you know, would be and he describes like the shot to me. So usually I get it in the first drawing, sometimes I have to push it to two. If it's a really difficult shot, I might have to just quickly do a third sketch. Christian understands very much the sensibility that I have. and We started storyboarding as we were writing the script, so we didn't even wait for the script to be finished. It's his way of checking that the ideas that he has for telling the story are going to work. I mean, that is the single thing that I think storyboards are most valuable for, for me, is that they're a cheap pass at the movie. You know, I, I get to make the movie at a really, really low cost for the price of a few pencils and some paper. But it effectively has put me through the process of making the film. As a director, I, I've, I've had a go. I've done version number one. And I can get to look at the movie complete. Which was a great tool. It was never intended and never was the final version of the movie. I've worked with some directors who will storyboard their film, and you'll really see those storyboards on screen. Peter's not that director, that kind of a director. Peter uses it for inspiration, for communication with the departments, but you know that those storyboards are going to change. They're a starting point, not an end point for Peter. Not only doing the storyboards, but then having them shaded and then photographing them as an animatic. We had made what we called an animatic, which was basically um, videotaping each frame of the storyboards. The storyboards are all you know, digitised, they're edited together as the shots will or would be edited together in the film. And it, it's basically a little, you know, a little black and white 2D drawing version of, of the film itself. We'd got some local New Zealand actors together in a studio, um, and there was five or six actors and they had read through the script in a recording studio playing the different characters and um, and then those voice tracks had been edited with the storyboards what 
are you doing? Fried eggs, sausages and nice crispy bacon. I've saved some for you, Mr. Frodo. You idiots! Put this out! I was looking at a, at a version like of the Lord of the Rings as almost like a comic book with, with words, and we put temp music with it. You're, you're seeing the storyboards as they pace in the film, as you want them to pace in the film, and so you get a feeling for the progression of story and the pacing of the storytelling. Peter told us about it, and he was like, all right, I'll screen it for you before we start filming. And um, we all got to Pete's house, and he screened us this animatic, and it was a trip to read the script and, and talk about the script and get ready for the process of making the film, and then suddenly see a, a very rough compilation of those ideas put onto the screen. I mean, in some ways, we'd felt like we'd watched the film. What was great about that is the script was powerful enough that it, it actually came across and it resonated uh, in that rough form. And what we did on this movie, which I'd never done before, is I wanted to go one more stage with the storyboards and make them more accurate than they usually are. Grant Major would draw up the final plans for each set that had been designed. Some of these were initially made into architectural models which uh, were made fairly, fairly quickly. We ended up calling them animatic models and we used them um, so that Peter could actually get a lipstick camera, get little toys, you know, we get little figurines that we always had like hobbit size, you know, human size, you know, Balrog size. We had all these little toys. It was great. He could actually have them in this little, you know, model that was either a reference point for the set or for a miniature down the road. So the storyboards that he had done previously were expanded on shot by shot um, by the use of his camera working around our models. And we'd have, have it hooked up to a video monitor that I'd have a freeze frame function on. And he'd say, OK, that's... You know, sometimes you'd just sit there and you'd see him sort of, you know, just pottering around, just trying to work out what kind of camera move he'd want to do for the shot. And you'd place the figures and he'd, you know, OK, that's the frame, I'd pause it and then draw from the screen. Christian could actually sit there and go, OK, so you're thinking this frame, yeah, OK. And then he could actually draw out, sketch out um, the storyboard that was reflected, reflected on the monitor that actually, you know, was to scale. That, you know, that was showing something that had the figure to the background all to scale and made sense and could actually be replicate, replicated when you thought about what you were shooting on the set. We basically knew that we were publishing a set of storyboards that were actually accurate, that this angle was here. And when we finally walked onto the set in a year's time with the actors and the full set was built, we'd be able to find exactly the same angle on set as we had with the miniature. Early on, essentially the first set that was ever constructed was Bag Ant. Peter uh, Jackson thought, hey, you know what, what we need to do is we need to go in there and, and get a video camera and, and I, I'm going to sort of work through kind of, you know, the space and just get a feeling for it. Yeah, you, you will keep an eye on Frodo, won't you? Yes, I will. Two eyes as often as I can spare them. Scene 12, shot one. I was very worried about Bag End because I knew just how small the set was and once you get 50 or 60 crew members in there it's going to become very cluttered very quickly and very difficult to work in. And so I wanted just to be able to really get my head into how we would shoot these scenes and I'd done my little um, lipstick camera mock-ups with a cardboard model some months earlier because we were also trying to figure out ways to shoot the scales too because we had Gandalf being, had to be tall and Bilbo and Frodo happened to be small, and, and we were starting to get our heads into how we were going to shoot all this stuff. And I got a few of the, of the people on the film. So we turned up on a Sunday on set with a, with a video camera. I played Bilbo and, and Rick Porus played something, and we, and we, sort, of, we sort of did a, a mock-up of the entire scene that we were going to shoot, ultimately with Ian McKellen and Elijah and Ian Holm. And, and then again, it, it turned out to be a, a relatively accurate... I mean, I think we made script changes eventually, so things altered a bit, but we, it turned out to be a relatively accurate version of what ultimately was in the film. Through me, that ring would wield a power too great and terrible to imagine. Beyond the storyboarding, we also did, like, another level of planning, um, which is sort of like bringing the storyboards to life in a variety of ways. And it's called pre-visualisation as well. It's called pre-vis.
Pete was able to use Previs to help him tell his story. He wanted to turn a lot of his 2D storyboards into 3D moving cameras. He's a very dynamic filmmaker. He likes big sweeping camera moves. Just at the, at the ideal moment while we were in pre-production, um, Rick McCallum, the producer of Star Wars, came to New Zealand on a trip and I was talking to Rick about the whole pre-visualization process and they'd obviously basically developed a, their own previs department for, the, for Star Wars. And so Rick said, look, if you're ever, you know, if you're ever in the States, you know, come by and uh, visit and we'll, and we'll show you what we've done. And so um, a few weeks later, we, we were in San Francisco and visited the ranch. And, you know, um, he was incredibly generous at just basically introducing us to their previous department. Rick McCallum and George Lucas have been incredibly helpful to, um, to him and to the rest of us in terms of just you know, offering advice with some of these new approaches that, that they were doing. So Peter really grabbed a hold of this idea and, and, um, and said, hey guys, this is something we should be doing. So what we, what we did was we, we went out and we, we searched for young, uh, you know, uh, recent graduates of, of graphic art schools and, uh, you know, you know the kind of the kind of um, folks that that love film and have a passion for film, maybe wanting to try to make a make a um, a foray into the world of visual effects, and this could be an interesting opportunity for them. Previs is doing about 144 shots from film one. The workshop and the art department provide the designs that we use in Previs to build um, in the computer. The shots that we're working on are effect shots and anything that Peter can't really get his head around. Um, that he wants to take a look at it in the 3D environment and that's what Previs is for, to um, help Peter create his vision. Peter was very much present in Previs and he'd come in, very exciting to him to see his, you know, see his movie coming to life and trying out the camera angles on sets that hadn't been built yet. First thing we did was the whole Casadoom stair chase. We built basically a copy of Alan's drawing sort of in 3D in a computer and began to experiment with angles and shots. The miniature of the staircase was also constructed by Richard Taylor. The actual miniature that ended up being used in the movie was one of the very first miniatures that Richard built and so we were able to also use that miniature to plot a lot of camera angles and to plan it. And so, you know, gradually over the course of possibly a year, this drawing of Alan Lee's had inspired and led to um, the creation of this hugely complicated, hugely expensive scene.